Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, I'm Pete Crane, uh, Vice President of Education and Access here at the National World War II Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Dr. Hal Baumgarten D-Day Commemoration Ceremony. As we begin today's program, please join me in welcoming Rabbi David Gerber to the stage for the invocation. I will tell you I've had the honor of offering blessing here before, and there's one thing that you absolutely cannot put down in words, which is the feeling of awe you get when you walk into this facility, not just for the incredible facility itself, but for all that it represents. So it is an honor to be here. Professor Stephen Ambrose said, at the core, the American citizen soldiers knew the difference between right and wrong and they didn't want to live in a world in which wrong prevailed. So they fought and won, and we, all of us, living and yet to be born, must forever be profoundly grateful. And we are here today to express our gratitude, to honor the service of the greatest generation and affirm our commitment to live up to their expectation that we choose the path of goodness. Elohenu velohea votenu v'imotenu, God of our ancestors, we give thanks for the freedom we inherited from generations past. We dedicate this day and this moment in hope that it inspires us not to achieve greatness, but to strive for goodness. A great task still lies before us, as the world can feel so dark sometimes. But our tradition teaches us that in moments of dedication, blessing, and memory, the symbol of the sacrifice of those who came before us is the symbol of light. Because it just takes a single light to chase away darkness. A single candle can illuminate countless other wicks and share its light without ever diminishing its own brightness. We stand tall on the shoulders of those who came before us. We carry with us the light of their strength and sacrifice. And we think for a moment of how much light exists in the world because of them. We pray to be able to carry their light and display even a fraction of their courage. And we know we walk forward in confidence that we know that their light eternally shines from their sacrifice, and we commit to using it to illuminate the world. Ken Yehi Ratzon, may this be God's will, as together we say, Amen. And now, please stand as the color guard presents the colors and our victory bells perform the French and American national anthems. Allons, enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. Contre nous de la tyrannie, l'étendard sanglant élevé, l'étendard sanglant élevé. Entendez-vous dans les campagnes mugir ces féroces soldats? Il vient jusque dans vos croix, égorger vos fils, vos campagnes. Aux armes citoyens, formez vos bataillons, marchands, 
marchant que sa grimpeur à preuve en ancien. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free? Please be seated. As we remember those who fought in Normandy so long ago, let's begin with the museum's tradition of recognizing any World War II veterans, home front workers, or Holocaust survivors in the audience or joining us virtually. Any World War II veterans, please stand or wave your hands to be recognized. Gentlemen, it's our honor to uh, pay tribute to you and your service every day here at the National World War II Museum, but especially today. Thank you. We're thrilled to have our friend and World War II veteran Robert Lowry here. Robert enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1943 and was deployed to the Eastern, the European Theater of Operations, where he was assigned as a gunner's mate aboard an LST-538, defending against German air attacks. He was at Omaha Beach on D-Day, and he was also deployed to Okinawa by the war's end. We also have Sam Meyer with us here today, who was also in the European Theater of Operations and, and fought uh, in Europe. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. We are so thrilled to have you with us today. I'd also like to recognize all other veterans and active duty military in attendance with us today. If you were ever wore our nation's uniform, please either stand or wave your hand to be recognized. Thank you as well, and also thank you for joining us today. This morning, I know we also have some of our Patriot Circle or Charter members in attendance. Please also stand or wave. So thank you, Charter members. Our Patriot Circle members' support makes programs like this possible. So thank you for your continued commitment to the museum and to our educational mission. I'd now like to turn the podium over to, to Stephen Watson, our president and CEO of the National World War II Museum for his remarks.
Good morning, and thank you, Pete. Well, of course, this is an important day for our museum, and I would say an important day for the world. And uh, I want to start by thanking uh, each of you for spending it here at the National World War II Museum. I think you know that 78 years ago today, over 150,000 men embarked upon what General Eisenhower would call the Great Crusade, risking their lives as they landed on the coast of Normandy. You'll get a historical overview in a few minutes from our executive director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, Dr. Mike Bell. So Mike, I promise I'm not gonna steal all your thunder up here. But I think it's safe to say that the stakes could not have been higher. Nazi Germany controlled most of Europe, and it was clear that the campaign to defeat Hitler hinged on the success of D-Day. Planning for the cross-channel invasion of northern France was a massive undertaking, requiring the cooperation of 12 countries and taking way more than a year to put it all together. It was a colossal operation. I think you know, codenamed Operation Overlord, and would become one of the largest and perhaps most complex amphibious invasions in world history. I think we also know that the ultimate success of the Allied forces on D-Day was a turning point in the war which helped secure our eventual victory. And that success came at a tremendous cost. Although by some estimates the casualties on D-Day weren't as bad as they could have been, there were over 10,000 Allied casualties on D-Day alone. Just think about that, 10,000 Allied casualties in the first 24 hours of the Normandy invasion. The significance of D-Day would reverberate throughout the world, but it would be especially significant for our allies in Europe, who had been waiting for years for liberation. This invasion not only signaled for Europe, but signaled hope for Europe, but was the culmination of what Sir Winston Churchill had wished for, a united Anglo-American effort to fight against Nazi Germany, something he had longed for since the beginning of the war in Europe. Today, I think as some of you know, we are honored to have Emma Soames, the granddaughter of Sir Winston Churchill here with us. Thank you for being here on this most important day, Emma. We look forward to hearing your remarks in just a moment. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Emma what seems like 100 years ago now in January of 2020 before the world changed when we had uh, wonderful few days in Lafayette, Louisiana, including uh, a Churchill Symposium that Emma spoke at. Uh, later in the program this morning, you'll be hearing from Emma about her mother's experience on D-Day in the Churchill household. So thank you again, Emma, for being here. D-Day has always been a significant day to the National World War II Museum. 22 years ago today, um, we opened as the National D-Day Museum Hands up if you were here that day. I know we have a few folks that were here. A remarkable day for this museum, or I think a remarkable day for New Orleans that we will all remember for the rest of our lives. There were a few folks, uh, special folks, that I want to recognize that were here on that opening day, and those are three volunteers. And I think if you've visited the museum, you know how important our volunteers are. Uh, we have almost 300 active volunteers in the museum. They've given over 1.1 million hours of service to the museum in the last 22 years, and they are my informal advisory committee that love to give me lots of feedback. Um, but three of those folks in particular were here that day, um, Joyce Dunn, Ronnie Abu, and Gaston Andre. I want you to stand and be recognized. Not only were they here 22 years ago to help us get open, but they have remained committed volunteers to the museum. And collectively, if my math is correct, they've given over 40,000 hours of volunteer service to the museum, those three individuals over the last 22 years. So 
Thank you. Much appreciated. I also want to recognize the man who really is largely responsible for us all being here today, and that is our founding president and CEO and current president and CEO emeritus, Dr. Nick Mueller. Please stand and be recognized, Nick. It was 10 years before that opening day in 1990 that Nick and his best friend, Dr. Stephen Ambrose, had the vision for this museum, but not only did they have the vision, they had the tenacity and the perseverance through some tough years in the 1990s to believe in this mission, believe in this story, and of course, ultimately, open the National D-Day Museum on June 6, 2000, the 56th anniversary of D-Day. So Nick has dedicated 30 years of his life to this mission, to telling not only the story of D-Day, but really helping us create a comprehensive museum that tells the entire American experience in World War II. So Nick, our thanks to you. Your, the fruits of your labor are here for us all to see, and uh, we appreciate you being here on this important day as well. I also want to take a moment, Pete already recognized Mr. Lowry, but I want to take a moment to recognize my friend, Mr. Lowry, who, as you heard, served on D-Day. Um, and as he showed me earlier this morning, he was also here on June 6, 2000, and may have the only remaining ticket stub from that day. So if you get a chance to shake Mr. Lowry's hand after the presentation, I'm sure he'll be glad to show you the ticket stub from the grand opening events on 2000. But we are honored that you're here, Mr. Lowry, to mark this special day, and we're honored to have your oral history and our digital collection, which will be preserved and shared with Americans for generations to come. So thank you for being here. And also, I think a few of you may remember from last year, uh, Mr. Lowry is a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan, so go Cubs. and had the chance to go see his Cubs for the first time in Chicago last summer. So, so while our name has changed and our mission has expanded to cover the entire American experience in World War II, the museum, of course, has continued to pay tribute to the man who stormed the beaches of Normandy through our programs like today, our collections, and of course, our exhibits. This includes our original exhibit, the D-Day Invasion of Normandy in the Louisiana Memorial Pavilion, which I hope if you haven't already, you will take uh, a few hours today to visit that exhibit. 22 years later, it is still incredibly powerful. We also continue to hold a special bond with D-Day veterans across the country. And one of those veterans, of course, was Dr. Hal Baumgarten. Dr. Hal, as he was known to us here at the museum, was truly a special man. He was assigned to Company B of the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division. He landed on Omaha Beach, first wave, dog green sector at six o'clock in the morning on June 6th. He was wounded five times in the first 32 hours of fighting and had to be evacuated by a hospital ship. Of the 30 men who landed on his Higgins boat that morning, only he and one other made it off that beach alive. Dr. Howe was a tremendous friend to our museum. He was the featured speaker, proudly so, at the opening of the D-Day Museum 22 years ago today. He traveled with us to Normandy multiple times on the 60th anniversary of D-Day in 2004. And I personally had the privilege of traveling with him in 2005 for the 61st anniversary with his wife, Rita, who is here with us today. And Rita, please stand and be recognized for a moment. It was a... Uh, remarkable experience to travel from London through Normandy to Paris with Hal and Rita, to be on the beach on the morning of June 6th and hear Dr. Hal tell his story. Uh, it's something I will always cherish and never forget. 
and uh, it's just wonderful, Rita, to see you and for you to be here with your family again on this most important day. In keeping with our tradition of inviting one of Dr. Hal's family to speak on D-Day, my final task for this morning is to have the privilege of introducing his daughter, Karen Scher. Karen Baumgarten Scher grew up in Miami and Jacksonville, Florida, and graduated from Sophie Newcomb College at Tulane University in 1974 and Tulane Law School in 1977. She married Leopold Scher in 1975, and they have two daughters, Rose and Samantha, and a son-in-law, Jeremy. They are also the adoring grandparents of three-year-old twins, Jonathan and Rachel. After a successful career as an attorney, Karen is now, now this is a new phrase for me, granny nannying, and doing what, doing volunteer work, including being an important part of many initiatives here at the National World War II Museum that help honor both her father's service and Leopold's parents who are Holocaust survivors. So Karen, thank you for your support over the years and for your dedication to honoring your, honoring your father and your family's legacy. And with that, please join me in welcoming Karen Scher. Thank you for that warm introduction. I appreciate it. It's so good to see such a good turnout. I'm the daughter of Hal Baumgarten, and it's really a thrill to be here to tell you about my dad. As you heard, dad is affectionately known here at the museum as Dr. Hal, but to me, he was always dad or daddy. Dad was born on March 2nd, 1925 in New York City, the youngest of three children with two older sisters, Ethel and Beatrice. His father, Morris, immigrated from Austria to the U.S. as a teenager, and my dad considered his dad a hero because his dad taught himself how to read and write English and speak English. Dad's mother, Rose Weitzman, taught Dad how to read and write when he was only three years old. Dad's childhood was especially charmed, and as the only son and the baby of the family, he was doted on and spoiled. At school, Daddy was a whiz. He had a photographic memory. Besides being a good student, he loved sports of all kinds and was an exceptional athlete. Dad entered New York University at the age of 16, joined ROTC and was drafted at 18. After training in South Carolina and Maryland, Daddy shipped to England for more infantry training. Daddy was assigned to Company A, 1st Battalion of the 116th Infantry Regiment 29th Division, but was later transferred on the eve of the invasion to Company B. While Daddy was in Plymouth, England, Colonel Charles D.W. Canham addressed his special group, which had been tapped to invade France, telling the men that he predicted that two out of three of them would not return home. This was a frightening, dire prediction for a 19-year-old to receive. Daddy felt sh sure there was no way he was going to make it out alive. Journalist Gerald Parshall wrote in the May 23, 1994 issue of U.S. News and World Report in an article entitled, Theirs But to Do and Die, the following. In B Company, Private Harold Baumgarten assumed he'd be among the ones to die. He wrote his sister in New York to get to the mailbox first so she could break the news to his parents 
gently. I have asked this question to myself many, many times. If I had been in my dad's shoes, would I have had the courage to do what he did? On D-Day morning, June 6th, 1944, the weather was foggy and rainy. Everything that could go wrong did. The Air Force and Navy were thwarted by the bad weather from providing more cover and protection to the landing troops. Companies A and B, despite the terrible weather, traveled in the mothership Empire Javelin, where they were transferred to small landing craft vehicles, or LCVs. Unfortunately, Daddy arrived ashore in a British landing craft rather than the sturdier Higgins boat. I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't plan that well, Emma. <laughs> the riflemen were to disembark near the shore. Dad was only one of two of the 30 men on the LCV to survive. Many of the men drowned when they got out of the small boats because their heavy combat jackets weighed them down. Many were killed by the bullets coming from snipers and pillboxes hidden in the bluff. On the beach were diabolical traps, barbed wire, and landmines. Steven Spielberg, in the movie Saving Private Ryan, relied on my dad's description of the beach to recreate the setting that gut-wrenching setting of D-Day Omaha Beach. I remember asking my father about the accuracy of the portrayal in Saving Private Ryan. He said that the actual scene, the reality, was far worse than in the movie. He said it was living hell and that he saw things that no 19-year-old should ever have to see. Dad was wounded five times. His first wound occurred when a shell exploded, hitting his left cheek and ripping his cheek and left upper jaw away, leaving his teeth and gums lying on his tongue and his left cheek flapping from his ear. A medic, Sergeant Cecil Breeden, patched up that first horrendous wound and Dad described Breeden as an angel saying in his memoirs, even today, when I think about Cecil, I see a halo over his helmet. Despite that first painful wound, Daddy tenaciously kept fighting. He wore during combat a gift from his father, a Rima brand watch. His best buddy in Company B, Bob Garbett, made him a new watch band for the watch with some leather from Bob's belt. At about 10 a.m. on D-Day, Dad rescued a wounded buddy, John Frazier, of Company A. Dad carried the fallen Frazier over his shoulder to shelter behind the seawall. Dad received his second wound of shrapnel to the left side of his head during this rescue. Frazier survived D-Day and was able to thank my father years later. Next, Dad got a third wound to his left foot when he stepped on a castrator mine. You can see that it hurt his foot, but nothing else since I'm here. <laughs> Dad fought valiantly until after midnight on June 6th when he received his fourth wound to the left side of his upper lip. He then collapsed in a ditch filled with corpses of dead fellow soldiers. His final wound occurred on June 7th when he was shot in the right knee. His five wounds required many surgeries and they healed the best they could. Who can say if his psychological wounds ever healed? Daddy said he had survivor's guilt. He wanted to give back and help others in gratitude for God sparing his life. He finished college at NYU, served as president of his junior class, and was on the baseball and track teams. He next got a master's degree and a medical degree at University of Miami. Before going to medical school, he taught chemistry, physics, 
in biology at Palm Beach High School. And he got to be the assistant coach of the school's football team where actor Burt Reynolds was a member of the team. It was love at first sight when a friend introduced him to my beautiful mom, Rita Snyder, where, who was wearing a black one-piece bathing suit. Mom and Dad married on June 4th, 1949, and were each other's soulmates and best friends until Dad's death on Christmas Day, 2016. They produced three children, Bonnie, Hal, and me. Bonnie and Hal really wanted to be here today and regret it. Adored by his patients, Dad worked as a family practice physician in Jacksonville, Florida for decades. I know he was loved by his patients because I had the wonderful experience of, on occasion of sitting as the receptionist at his office. Daddy didn't talk much about his wartime experiences, but Bonnie, Hal, and I knew he had medals and that he had aches and pains from his injuries. He had a long scar down the left side of his cheek, which I thought did not diminish how handsome he was. All of us thought he looked just like Vincent Edwards in the TV show, Ben Casey. It would have been a loss to the world if Daddy's story didn't get told. But serendipity stepped in to make sure Daddy's story would live on. My mom convinced him to attend a dedication of a monument in Normandy in 1988 at the reunion of his fellow soldiers in France, he had a catharsis and began talking. Historian Stephen Ambrose asked him to tape his oral history. Dad and Dr. Ambrose were kindred spirits and became very close friends over the years. Ambrose encouraged Daddy to both lecture and write about his memories of D-Day. He pointed out to Daddy that Dad had the four magic ingredients that made him the perfect veteran to be a public speaker. One, he had a great memory. Two, he was willing to share his wartime experiences. Three, he was articulate. He wouldn't be up here with this. He, he didn't need notes. And he was there. Dad wrote three books about his wartime experiences. His goal was to honor his fallen buddies and give back by perpetuating their memories. Daddy's last book, D-Day Survivor, an autobiography published in 2006, is available at the museum's gift shop, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Kindle. I recommend that if you want to know more about my fascinating father, you read his book. Dad was a natural orator, spoke without notes, and genuinely enjoyed conveying his message. He spoke many times at this museum, in addition to other places in the US and the world. Journalists covered his stories. Tom Brokaw interviewed him in France and Jacksonville, Steven Spielberg used Daddy's oral history, and Daddy was a popular speaker at schools, on the radio, on TV, before rotary clubs and police departments and in other museums. How I was proud to hear him speak at my children's school, Isidore Newman, where you could have heard a pin drop as he spoke. And of course, I was here at this museum to hear him speak countless times. One of my favorite times was when he spoke on a panel of experts about army nurses. I recall that during the gala dinner for the grand opening of, D -Day, of the D-Day Museum, this museum's predecessor, Daddy spoke immediately before actor Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks quipped, sure, they had me follow the veteran a tough act to follow. He's the real thing, and I'm just an actor. I admire Dad's choice 
to have been willing to give his life for our country when he was so young. I also admire his will to live and overcome devastating wounds, to go on and live a productive, admirable, happy life. I attribute his steadfastness and his courage to his belief in God, his honesty and integrity, and his gratefulness for God sparing his life and for bringing him, my mother, the woman of his dreams. He was told he might never walk again, but he went on to turn cartwheels. I can't do that. Play tennis, basketball, golf, and be our family's personal doctor, teacher, comedian, carpenter, gardener, pool cleaner, and painter, among other things. I feel blessed and grateful to be his daughter. When I look in the mirror, I can see his face. I wish that our physical resemblance might mean that I'm also blessed with some of his many good inner qualities. I recall once complaining about a pimple on my face. Daddy reminded me that when he was around my age, he couldn't bear to look in a mirror. He looked like a monster, and it took many plastic surgeries to put his face back together. Daddy also told me that he, ne he learned never to judge people by their appearances. He remembered people staring at his facial wounds and shunning him when he limped into religious services, dragging his wounded foot and leg. While Daddy was alive, he was a cheerleader for this museum. I'm so happy we can honor him by hosting a Dr. Hal Day every June 6th. It's bittersweet, but a joy for me that I can visit this museum anytime I want, and I can walk up to the D-Day wing where my dad's Rima watch is on display. If I arrive exactly at the right moment, I can hear my father's voice and see his beautiful face on a continuously running video that features about a dozen veterans' spellbinding stories. It's a good feeling to know that my father's life and his story will live on at the National World War II Museum. Here at this museum, Daddy's sacrifice to defeat the Nazis, to make our world safe, and to bring freedom to Europe will be forever recognized and appreciated. I want to thank, thank you, Stephen Watson, Stephen Watson, the stellar head of this museum, and a dear friend to my parents. Likewise, former museum CEO Nick Mueller's friendship means so much to me. It really touched me that he wrote a beautiful book recently that you all should also buy, uh, mentioning my father. Likewise, I especially treasure the friendship of Jeremy Collins. Kudos to Shalita Bourgeois and Maggie Hartley for their amazing help with today's and previous programs. But my deepest thanks go to my mom, my husband, Leopold, my children, Rose, Samantha, Jeremy, my beautiful grandchildren, Rachel and Jonathan, those precious grand twins, and of course, my wonderful siblings, I wish they were here now, next year, Bonnie and Hal. They are the best family in the world. And to close with the rallying cry of all those great soldiers of the 29th Infantry Division, 29, let's go. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. We had 85% casualties, first 15 minutes. 
I was wounded five times. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. When our ramp went down, the signal for every machine gun on that beach to open up on the exit to our ship. Harold Donaldson, the lieutenant, was gunned down in the boat like you see in Saving Private Ryan. The feller in front of me, Clarus Riggs, was machine gunned on the ramp. I dove in behind him. Only my left side of my helmet was creased by a bullet. So we were losing men right and left. The water was full of blood. There were a, a group of us running across the beach with our rifles at port arms, which is the rifle across your chest. When we got to about 135 yards away from the seawall, a machine gun spray came from the trenches up on the, uh, the bluff. And I heard a loud thud on my right front and my rifle vibrated. I turned it over. There was a clean hole through its receiver, which is a little rectangular plate in front of the trigger guard. My seven bullets had stopped in the magazine section, had stopped the German bullet. Another thud behind me to the left, and that guy was gone too. I hit the sand behind the hedgehog, which is about 130 yards from the seawall. And uh, I observed to my right, uh, Private Robert Dittmar, Fairfield, Connecticut. I was yelling, uh, lay, he tripped over the hedgehog, spun completely around, lying on his back and yelling, I'm hit, I'm hit, mom, mother, and then he was silent. I looked over to my left and Sergeant Clarence Robeson of Lynchburg, Virginia. I always mention their names and where they came from. I don't want people to forget about them. Clarence Robeson was staggering by me without his helmet, gaping hole in the left side of his forehead. His blonde hair was streaked with blood. I was yelling, get down. This used to be my nightmares. I'd be yelling, get down, because uh, I never forgot that scene. And I guess he couldn't hear me anyway. The noise on that beach was horrendous. He staggered all the way behind me to the left, knelt down, and he started praying with his rosary beads. And the machine gun up on the bluff fired over my head and cut him in half. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. I was cursing that pillbox on the right flank, and a shell went off in front of me, 88 millimeter. It blew off this cheek, gave me a hole in the roof of my mouth, I had teeth and gums laying on my tongue. This jaw was shot away, left upper jaw. The cheek was flapping over my ear. And I looked in to my left front and Bedford Hoback of Bedford, Virginia, got hit with the same shell uh, right in the face and went under the four inches of water. He was dead. Good luck and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. Wow. Thank you, Karen. Uh, for sharing your father's story with us. And Rita, thank you so much for being here with us today. It's our honor to remember Dr. Hal and those he fought with every year on the 6th of June. In just a moment, Dr. Michael Bell will provide today's historical overview. Dr. Bell is the executive director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. He commissioned, he's a soldier. He was commissioned in the Armor Corps following graduation from West Point and is a combat veteran, a historian, a strategist, who has served at every level from platoon through theater army, as well as at the United States Central Command, 
the Joint Staff, the West Point faculty, and the National Defense University. He holds an MA and PhD in American History from the University of Maryland at College Park, and an MS in National Security Strategy from the National Defense University, where he was a distinguished graduate of the National War College. Please join me in welcoming Mike to the stage. Thanks, Pete. You know, tough act to follow. And uh, reminds me of one day in the White House, they said, uh, tell us about the Civil War. Hurry up, you only have two minutes. And uh, so, so my task is to give an overview of, of, of D-Day and put it in perspective. We've heard some amazing pieces already. But on June 6, 1944, the United States demonstrated that it was capable of projecting military force anywhere in the world, even in the face of determined enemies. That day set the stage for the surrender of Nazi Germany 11 months later, and it marked a turning point in world affairs and America's role in the world. Now, we know how D-Day turned out, so with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to miss Clausewitz's dictum that war is the realm of uncertainty and chance. War is never a sure thing. Now, commenting on the moral and physical dimension of war, Clausewitz observed that war involved aspects of fear, physical survival, and moral courage. He noted that those dimensions played out in the context of what he called genius, fog, and friction. So first, let's consider the genius, the outcome and the achievement of D-Day. It's a global war. Sometimes we think about a single battle and we lose sight of what else American forces were doing, not to mention the Red Army on the Eastern Front. What happened at Normandy is impressive when you consider what other U.S. forces and operations were underway at the same time. Two massive operations were underway just the day before. Testament to the new American military industrial complex. On June 5th, the tanks and infantry of General Clark's 5th Army entered Rome with the 1st Armored Division and five infantry divisions, soon in combat along a 20-mile front. That same day, Admiral Spruance's armada departed Pearl Harbor with an amphibious corps, two marine divisions, and an infantry division, 71,000 troops that would land at Saipan nine days later. From Saipan, the home islands of Japan would be within the operational radius of the new B-29 superfortress. Incredible effort in addition to the D-Day effort. So let's turn back to Northern Europe and Normandy. An operation of this magnitude and complexity had never been attempted and arguably hasn't since. First of all, it's also important to recall this is an allied campaign. It's a coalition effort with all of its benefits and its associated frictions. I don't believe they're allies, but, uh, but setting the stage for this was a massive deception operation, Operation Fortitude, which was calculated to convince Hitler that the real Allied offensive would be the West, uh, in the West would be targeted at Calais, where the English Channel was, was much more narrow. The result was to keep many of the German forces pinned north of the River Seine. In addition, the strategic bombing offensive had shifted to isolate the region and going after the transportation system, ensuring that the German reinforcements would be hindered in the campaign. But now let's think about the effort overall. The invasion was massive. Nearly 160,000 Allied troops landed at Normandy on one day, of which 73,000 were American. So just less than half were American. We can't forget our Canadian and our, our, our British comrades. By the end of the day, 34,000 Americans had disembarked on Omaha Beach, and nearby Utah, another 23,000, and behind them were 15,500 American paratroopers. Incredible numbers. Now, in addition to the British and Canadian forces who landed in strength at Juneau, at Sword, and at Gold, the, the, the British also assaulted with nearly 8,000 paratroopers, and the effort included Australians, Belgians, Czechs, Dutch, French, Greeks, New Zealanders, Norwegians, Rhodesians, and Poles, operating in land, air, and sea, and of course, supported by French resistance fighters. Now let's think of the numbers here. There's over 11,000 attack and support aircraft and over 7,000 vessels involved in this operation. On the morning of June 6, 200 warships, 
battleships, cruisers, destroyers are involved in the shore bombardment. Now, it's genius that coordinated, deconflicted, and brought all that together. Now to the fog. There's plenty of fog on D-Day. Certainly there's fog for Dwight D. Eisenhower. At 8 o'clock in the morning, he's going to send an update to George Marshall, but he's not sure what to send. At 1.30, the 101st Airborne had, had parachuted behind Utah Beach. At 2.30, the 82nd had dropped to secure the right flank of the beachhead. At 5.30, the initial elements of six Allied divisions began their assault landings on five beaches. But Eisenhower could admit, as yet I have no information concerning the actual landings. He didn't know if they had succeeded, and he reports that to General uh, Marshall. Eisenhower remained cautious. In his wallet, he had the famous handwritten note in the event of failure. He was ready to accept responsibility for the outcome and the decision to make the attack. So as far as Clausewitz go, Eisenhower is a great example of what he would call moral courage. Now, next to Clausewitz's friction and physical courage, certainly D-Day is replete with those. Night parachute drops and glider assaults, often scattered far from their assigned landing uh, drones or drop zones. For the assault companies, the sea state, the tide, the wind, fog, smoke, all provide a fog of war and add to the friction, as did very resolute enemies. 40,000 German troops manned the Normandy front, overwatching 200,000 beach obstacles. All of those placed the outcome in the balance. Now, on four of the five beaches, the landings weren't easy, but they went off in relative smoothness. The troops got ashore with casualties that were lower than expected. But the landing on that fifth beach, Omaha, came close to disaster. And failure at Omaha in the center would put all the landings at risk. Now, among the assault companies, the, landing, the, assault, the losses were the heaviest. As Stephen mentioned, over 10,000 casualties that day, 6,600 uh, 6, US casualties killed, wounded, and missing. Alongside them, 2,700 casualties from the United Kingdom and 946 Canadian comrades in arms. Now let's briefly consider the overall achievement of D-Day, uh, really informed by the wars of the last 20 years that I've been involved with. Iraq at its height during the surge, the force was about 170,000 troops. Roughly the same number of allies landed on D-Day alone in 24 hours. Now the surge of forces consisted of about uh, 21,000 troops and took six months to deploy. In contrast, over 23,000 British and American paratroopers landed in the dark on the morning of June 6th and went into combat. An incredible achievement. 1,500 tanks and over 12,000 vehicles came ashore that day. But more was followed. Over the course of uh, uh, the war in Iraq, a million American service members served. Eisenhower's army, in contrast, in the two months following Normandy, had more than two million allies come ashore and continue mission, and it would continue to grow. So this is an incredible, incredible achievement. Now, a short notice uh, mention of casualties, since sometimes the perspective is hard for us to picture today. 2,500 Americans were killed on D-Day, but that's the roughly the same number of service members, 2,500, killed in Afghanistan in 20 years. So it's an incredible, incredible sacrifice. Now briefly, let me go through the tactical problem on Omaha Beach where m many of the American casualties occurred. The Allies had expected to find a reinforced German battalion defending Omaha. Unfortunately, the intelligence missed the recent arrival of a German division, and it had two regiments covering Omaha Beach, a massive increase and an unfortunate example of the fog of war. American doctrine called for the attacker to amass at least a three to one advantage against the defender. But that was not anywhere near the case on Omaha. Instead, the defenders initially had the advantage in numbers. In the dark, fighting wind and tide, facing heavy, heavy enemy fire, uh, you know, we saw it from, from Hal's piece there. You can see how platoons, companies, battalions and regiments got intermingled between the 1st Division and the 29th Division along the five-mile stretch of Omaha. Now, I was a young tank platoon leader. I had the privilege of being attached to the 1st Battalion, 16th Infantry Regiment, the Big Red One. So their story on Omaha has remained an important one for me for decades. As you can imagine, 
and as we've heard, the Higgins boats came under fire as they approached the beach. On Omaha, which was the most heavily defended, the defenders averaged 10 strong points every two miles. With 35 pillboxes interspersed, closely supported by an incredible 85 machine guns, 28 mortars, and 35 anti-tank and field guns. This is an incredible number. Now, it's not just the density of the defenses, but it's also the depth and the area they could fire into. At low tide, once the soldiers came ashore in the assault companies, the two lead battalions from the 16th Regiment and the 116th Regiment and the uh, Ranger companies, they would have to go as far as 600 meters, so five football fields with end zones end to end as you move forward. Now, of course, in some cases, the men are landed farther out on sandbars and still have another 200 meters to wade to get to the beach before the 600 meters. Now, once ashore, they had to get past these series of obstacles to make the German defenses more effective. There's ramps with mines, uh, obstacles known as Rommel's asparagus, Belgian gates, Czech hedgehogs, anti-tank walls, ditches, and of course the seawall and marshy areas, all very diabolical. And for the soldiers, every step had to be a tremendous strain. The soldiers who made it to the beach landed with loads of 60 to 90 pounds, not including the extra weight from the water. So roughly 40 to 65% of their body weight. While the beach sloped gradually upwards for the first 500 meters, the final push was up a steep bluff, roughly 30 to 50 meters high, the average of a 10-story building. But like most, uh, unlike most 10-story buildings, there's not pillboxes at the top. And so uh, for those assault companies, as we've heard, casualties are quite severe. The second assault wave landed between seven and eight, more followed. Uh, the tanks supporting the first division that day of that battalion, only five would be operational the next day. Now, ultimately what made a difference on Omaha, though, wasn't the tanks or the weaponry. Uh, the Germans had an advantage there, uh, but it's a small number of brave GIs who refused to give in, who didn't admit defeat, who pressed forward even when wounded, and who assaulted the German bunkers time after time. And they pushed to the bluffs overlooking the beach, and they won the battle. By nine o'clock, more than 600 soldiers had reached the bluffs and were advancing inward. And although fierce fighting continued in an effort to clear the draws and the routes off the beach, by noon, the German defenses had been breached in four places. To honor their achievement today, 78 years later, their genius, their courage in the face of fog and friction, I'd like to close with a few lines from President Roosevelt's D-Day address that he made to the nation in the form of a prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will be sore tried by night and by day, without rest until the victory is won. The darkness will be rent with noise and flame. Men's souls will shaken with the violence of wars. For these men are drawn, are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. As Stephen mentioned earlier, uh, we're proud to be joined today by Emma Soames. The Honorable Emma Soames is a broadcaster and columnist who's been editor of the Literary v Review, Tattler, and the Daily Telegraph magazine. She's the second child of Mary and Christopher Soames and is her mother's literary executor. Uh, and, oh, by the way, she's also Winston Churchill's granddaughter. Please join me in welcoming Emma Soames to the stage. Hello, good afternoon. 
And um, I must just open by saying what an honor and privilege it is to be with you all at the World War II Museum on D-Day. And what I have heard uh, before my remarks have been so powerful and moving. Um, and I can only provide you with a very different view of D-Day. Um, my mother was Winston Churchill's youngest daughter. And um, on the 1st of January, 1939, when she was 16 years old, she started keeping a diary, as you do when you're a teenage girl. And then um, in September, on her 17th birthday, three days later, war was declared. Um, she was living with her parents at Chartwell, where some of you, which some of you may have visited, and her, on the declaration of war, her father was made um, head of the Admiralty. And so they moved to um, live in Admiralty House. And only months later, they were living in Number 10 Downing Street. And her father was Prime Minister. And so her diary is launched and she keeps it pretty much throughout the war. She spends a lot of time with her parents during the war, um, and more and more she sees the stress and strain that her father is put under because he is effectively, as far as the British are concerned, the only man who knows everything. And he cannot really share what he knows with anybody except possibly his nearest and dearest. Um, in 1941, um, at the sophisticated age of 19, my mother joins the ATS, which is the equivalent of your um, WAC. And um, like your WAC, it, at that point, they became professional soldiers. And um, they began to take on the roles that were uh, formerly only taken by men and my mother spent most of the war in anti-aircraft batteries, which became increasingly important after D-Day when Hitler launched his doodlebugs, the V-1 bombs, which caused immense damage. Um, on D-Day, or around D-Day, um, my mother had been sent to a town called Aldershot, which is not a very prepossessing place, with apologies to anybody here who may come from there. <laughs> um, but it is, um, importantly, on the road to Portsmouth, and it had become a staging post for D-Day. And um, my mother, actually, in her memoir, explains how all of southern England was a staging post for D-Day. It was absolutely every road, every town, every port particularly, was jam-packed with soldiers. And um, but everybody was keeping the secret. Nobody talked about it because it was everybody, the nation was holding its breath. Um, and on Sunday the 4th of June, um, when my mother had just finished learning how to make um, scrambled eggs with powdered eggs for 400 people. Um, she had tea at the officers' club where everyone was in khaki, pleasant, calm, and yet above it all the sense of waiting. Now, on Monday, the 5th of June, uh, she had been married, my mother had been told by Clementine, um, Winston's wife, um, who'd whispered to her that D-Day was going to be on the 5th of June. So all day on the 5th of June, while she was learning to make scrambled eggs for 400, um, she was just passionate, listening with every fiber to hear the, 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 the beginning of D-Day, which she certainly would have done in all the shot. Um, but anyway, she went to a party, got home at about three in the morning, I don't think I could have been asleep very long. I suddenly awoke rather chilly and 
overheard a throbbing, continuous roar, and I knew D-Day was there. And on Tuesday the 6th of June, there were rumors running all around the, um, the town, and finally it was announced that what she had heard was D-Day. Um, so all her um, garrison, they all went to church. Um, and then, early that evening, we watched more than 400 planes towing gliders lumber ponderously out. What strange and awe-inspiring days. So that was my mother on D-Day. Meanwhile, um, what had been going on in her father's life in the few days around D-Day was fascinating because he was feeling the stress um, of, you know, this was the most important, in, a, in what must have felt like a very, very long war, the stress of um, taking the decision to um, adopt Operation Overlord and then to decide the date and press go on it um, was sort of really pretty unbelievable. Um, and so my grandfather marked the occasion by having a series of rows with people. Um, the first one he had was with the king, King George VI, who had become, who having started off as not liking my grandfather very much, I don't think, um, um, he, they came to actually be great friends. And on the 15th of May, the king was actually present at a briefing for um, at Mon uh, General Montgomery's army group headquarters. Um, Eisenhower was there, Churchill was there, um, and they were all sitting on the benches of the boys' school, which was Montgomery's former school. And the only thing that was different is that they were all smoking. <laughs> Anyway, my grandfather spoke for about half an hour, urging offensive leadership and stressing the ardor for battle which he believed the men felt. Um, then the king comes and has lunch um, with uh, Winston in the annex to number 10 where they had to live when the bombing was bad. And there was a terrific to and fro about whether um, Churchill could go to D-Day and he desperately wanted to go but the king said well I want to go too but if I can't go then you can't go I mean they descended to the level of schoolboys about it and then um, uh, the, the king's private secretary told Churchill that the king would find it hard to find a new prime minister in the midst of a major invasion of France. And Churchill replied, oh, don't worry, that's all arranged for. Um, then he argued that constitutionally Churchill could not leave the country without the king's consent. And um, Churchill said, no, no, because he'd be going on a British ship. So he would not actually be abroad. <laughs> and so it went on. And the next day, the king wrote um, my grandfather a very, very charming letter um, saying, you know, as a friend, really, I ask you most earnestly to consider the whole question again and not let your personal wishes, which I very well understand, lead you to depart from your own very high standard of duty to the state. So at the wish of his sovereign, um, my grandfather was grounded. And he spent the days before D-Day and D-Day itself commuting between Eisenhower's um, HQ in a place called Bushy. Um, then he, he, Churchill, had a, Eisenhower had a train, but Churchill also had a train. And so he commuted between the train and where he spent most time was in the map rooms at number 10. 
Um, and the night before D-Day, uh, uh, on the 5th, he went to the map rooms three times and taking my, at one point, my grandmother, Clementine, goes with him. And he is very, very sort of fraught up. He's like basically like a cat on a hot tin roof with a mixture of expectation and stress and worry um, of what he was, what they, they were asking men to do. Um, and of course, none of this was helped by the fact that D-Day had to be postponed by 24 hours because of the weather. So they were all G'd up for the 5th of June and then they couldn't go. Um, and on the 5th of June, at the cabinet um, of the British government, um, Amory, who I think was a war minister of some sort, said, Winston was evidently greatly stirred and at the end of his tether nervously, and no wonder, it is the most anxious moment of the whole war. Um, so, but then to, to actually, some recompense came in the um, taking Rome. And on the most wonderful moment comes um, on the 6th of June at noon, D-Day itself. Churchill announced the fall of Rome to the House of Commons. But he then said, I have also to announce to the House that during the night and the early hours of this morning, the first of a series of landings upon the European continent has taken place. And the atmosphere in the chamber was described as one of hushed awe. And this is a place, a bear pit, where normally, for, you know, for many, many years, my grandfather had been very criticized, shouted at, you know, the equivalent of eggs being thrown at him, not literally. But um, so for me, this feeling that the house fell silent with the declaration of D-Day, and quite right too, um, just shows what an extraordinary moment it was. But the stress to my grandfather did not stop there. Despite making it up with the king, he then had an argument with General de Gaulle now, this happened pretty often, but General de Gaulle wasn't going to allow a minor thing called D-Day to stand between him and a good punch-up with, with his supposed friends and allies. And this time, it was about um, oh, the personnel in the new, in the French, oh yes, the first thing that happened is they gave de Gaulle a speech that he could make before D-Day to his people in France. And he refused to make it because he wouldn't have been allowed to write it himself. Then a few days later, um, there was another row about who was going to be in the new French provisional government. Um, this is, of course, I'm, I'm deeply simplifying something that is a long and complex relationship between de Gaulle and my grandfather where the words humility and gratitude did not figure very often. <laughs> However, on the 12th of June, finally my grandfather got his way and he embarked in the destroyer HMS Kelvin for Normandy. He took uh, two people, generals with him, but not de Gaulle, with whom he was engaged in this furious row. Um, but he, just, he um, uh, persuaded the Kelvin's captain to take a plug at the Hun, as he put it. So they were firing, probably rather pointlessly, at German targets. So my grandfather obviously had the most wonderful time. That was where he wanted to be, on the front line. Um, and then they, they landed and Churchill was mobbed by all the soldiers who caught sight of him. He cruised up and down the coast from Aramanche on the River Orne, aboard a launch, watching the ships disembarking, troops, tanks, ammunition and equipment in immense quantities. Um, 
the, the Prime Minister, looking a bit exuberant from his trip to the beachhead, um, had to go to a defence committee the next day, and um, Cunningham noted that after his trip, Churchill was a bit childish at times. He was obviously very overexcited by his trip, his D-Day landing. Um, and so that is my family's D-Day, really. And I, may I close by saying what an honor and a privilege it is for me to be with you all here today and to remember D-Day. Thank you. Emma, thank you for sharing more about your family's experience on D-Day. This was wonderful. To hear more about her mother's wartime experience, join us back here tonight in the U.S. Freedom Pavilion or online at 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, for those joining us in person, there will be a reception uh, preceding the lecture. Also, uh, Emma will be available after uh, this ceremony uh, for the signing of her book, Mary Churchill's War, The Wartime Diaries of Churchill's Youngest Daughter, after the ceremony conclu concludes to the right of the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, Rabbi Gerber, Karen, Mike, and Emma, for helping us commemorate this pivotal day in World War II history. Also, thanks to everyone for joining us at this special commemoration ceremony virtually and on our campus. Before we conclude today's program, we do have a special treat for everyone in attendance. Since D-Day is also the museum's 22nd birthday, uh, we'd like to celebrate with each one of you. After we bring the Victory Bells back on for uh, their rendition of Happy Birthday, please be sure to grab a cupcake on your way out. So now, please join me in welcoming the Victory Bells back to stage for the museum's birthday. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. Please have a cupcake or a birthday cake and uh, join us again here next time at the National World War II Museum.